Would you ask Lord Pickle to come back in, please? Good afternoon. Are you ready to carry on, Lord Pickles? Of course. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Miller. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Lord Pickles, can we please have up on the screen uh, CLG 3036387, page 32 again. Um, we were looking at this before the break. Okay, um, yes. In particular, page 32, we were looking at paragraph 95. Yes. <clears throat> and I've already asked you some questions about it. And my, my question is, can you explain why the department is able, or was able in December last year, during the process of making submissions to this inquiry to say what you see is said at paragraph 95, but um, you as a Secretary of State could not see that at the time when you signed the letter. Well, a lot of things um, have happened since then. I think in particular uh, the follow-through on the uh, firm commitment I made to uh, the coroner uh, that there would be a review of um, of approved documents B. And I would have hoped and would have anticipated, given that the research um, for that, uh, that would have enabled that to start, arrived, though I wasn't aware of it at the time, in February, that actually we could really get moving on that. And... Uh, um, had, the, had I been Secretary of State, that would have been a very high priority to have done. Uh, but, it, uh, but because I, I've deliberately kept away from what happened after I left and have not really watched the sessions, I don't really know what did happen. No, I'm not asking you about <clears throat> anything happened after the 20th of May when you signed the letter. You can see from the submission here that the department is of the view that its response to recommendation four was not well structured and, it, and is unclear and difficult to follow when read against the text of the recommendations. So it's just comparing your response to the coroner's recommendations with the recommendations themselves. And my question again is, uh, why wasn't it clear to you when you signed the letter responding to the recommendations that, it, that your letter was not well structured, as the department now says, and was unclear and difficult to follow when read against the text of the recommendations. You make an extremely reasonable point, and I thought you made the point extraordinarily well yesterday. Uh, if you forgive me, I will repeat what I said. Um, I, I asked that the department do uh, a thorough job on this. I asked uh, that my permanent secretary should, should check the letter. Um, I then received no indication uh, in the usual channels that you would receive an indication that something was wrong, uh, which uh, would, uh, would have been, there would have been some community worry about it. There would have been worries by members of parliament. Um, uh, questions would have been tabled. It would have been subject uh, to review. <coughs> so... <clears throat> What, with, with, with the greatest possible respect, m m might be considered ambiguous after, a, after a, a catastrophic failure by government, wasn't apparent to me there, then. I thought I'd, I, I thought I'd genuinely be uh, uh, cover some. And uh, the inquiry can form its own opinion as to my character but I regard myself to be a diligent person. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd uh, followed due diligence before I signed the letter, and um, I believe I did. But I think it's the circumstances that followed in, in, the, uh, in the years that, that followed the, uh, my signing that has largely framed uh, the view, and I can see that. And I can see that this is not an unreasonable view uh, for the uh, department to take, given that a series of things are expected to do, which is not unreasonable, the following of the uh, coroner's recommendation, <coughs> was, doesn't seem to have been followed through. 
for no. reasons I don't understand. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, it's my fault. I overspoke. <clears throat> um, now, if you look at paragraph 96, it okay. says, the version of ADB relevant to the Ackham House inquest <coughs> was published in 2000. A new edition of ADB, which had been published in 2006, included a number of changes to the guidance concerning external envelopes and external spread of fire, including routes to compliance. Officials agreed that further general improvements could be made to the clarity and presentation of ADB, and the document had already been earmarked for redrafting in accordance with the department's new style guide, but they did not agree that it's in its 2006 iteration it was so inaccessible that a competent professional for whom the document was produced would not be able to understand the guidance it provided. And then it says this, and I want to focus your attention on this next sentence. Okay. This led officials to conclude that there was nothing about recommendation four, that's the um, building regulations recommendation, that was safety critical. Given that the work required to implement the agreed changes would take time and require significant consultation, the decision was taken to roll this clarification exercise into an ongoing wider review of ADB explained below with a proposed timeline of 2016 to 17 for completion. Now, my question, having read you that paragraph, in particular the paragraph to which, the sentence to which I drew your attention <laughs> in the middle, did, you, did, did your officials uh, tell you that there was nothing in recommendation for that was safety critical? I think I've, I, I think I've actually answered that, and I think I've given evidence to suggest that is precisely what they uh, they said. Um, uh, you know, matters were clouded because of the um, uncertainty of the expert witness uh, that gave evidence. Um, the fact that Mr. Martin said it was necessary for him to go into the witness box, if that's the right expression, in order to sort <coughs> out that clarification. Um, the assurances that I received from senior professionals to say the team's view is that this isn't quite as complicated as they sound. I think it's wholly consistent um, uh, with uh, that. And if they're... Um, you know, it was kind of the kind of assumption we will be able to pick up all what the um, coroner's asked for in the review we'll do. But I shouldn't worry because there wasn't a um, uh, well, pretty much what it says in, in, in there. So I think it's consistent with the evidence that I've already given. Did you ask your officials um, how it could be the case? <coughs> that there was nothing in recommendation four that was safety critical, given that it was in a recommendation after an inquest into six deaths, including the deaths of three children? Uh, believe me, um, you know, the fate of those uh, children in particular, uh, Michelle Undokawa, um, stays very much uh, central. But the argument was, and I think I've said this, was it was difficult to read, but most but people understand what it meant, and that it wasn't a that it wasn't a critical issue. Um, I was told that this was a a very rare event, but that it would be that it would be dealt with, and it would be dealt with um, in a reasonable way. Um, and so I have to say that seemed proportionate. Again, I have to say that. If there had been a consensus that I'd been reckless or wrong, the system itself would have put those things up. I'm sure the um, the coroner would have um, would have pulled me back and asked me to uh, to reconsider. I'm sure the house, uh, uh, the opposition would would have challenged me, but there was there was nothing that would make the the normal alarm bells ring within the system. Uh, that is a kind of extraordinary thing. Now given, say for example this, given this enormous importance now of cladding, if you look at the period from 2010 to 2015, there's not a single parliamentary question about it. There's, there's just nothing there. Nobody raised it with me. You know, when I was, uh, I learnt the news um, uh, in uh, in the early hours of the morning, I was actually in Luxembourg, so I was an hour ahead of everybody. So I, I kind of got it earlier than most people did. I, I wasn't sat there thinking, "Oh, well, that's a cladding problem." I was 
amazed that a block of flats could go up like that. And I just couldn't understand how, how it could have spread. Because everything I understood uh, from officials and from those concerned in fire, everything was about containment uh, and uh, ensuring that, you know, that if there was a fire, it wouldn't breach the boundaries. Uh, and the, how quickly it fired. I mean, I, I was listening to Radio 5, and while I was on Radio 5, they were describing how quickly it was spreading. And I was, I, I, remain, I was absolutely amazed. Now I know what, what had happened. I just, I found the whole thing utterly extraordinary. Uh, looking at paragraph 97 <clears throat> and 98. Could it not document. be moved up a little for me, please? Uh, yes, at paragraph 97, uh, it says this. The advice that was sent to ministers and the Secretary of State's subsequent response to the coroner failed to articulate clearly that the work was not considered to be safety critical or to explain how and why this view had been reached. Without this information, the response to the coroner was ambiguous as to whether the recommendation was accepted in full as safety critical, and this may have been the reason why, in turn, the coroner did not challenge or seek to correct any misunderstanding in the department's response. And then, in 98, as the work was not considered to be safety critical, it was not accorded the priority that it should have had within the department. Although the work was consistently progressed, it became subject to delays. Over time, the link between this work and the Lackland House coroner's recommendation was lost, and consequently, the work was not a ministerial priority. Now, um, uh, making allowances for the fact that, of course, you left office in May 2015, um, my first question, focusing <coughs> on um, paragraph 97 there, um, do you agree with what is written there, namely, from in the middle of the paragraph, uh, that the response to the coroner was ambiguous as to whether the recommendation was accepted in full as safety critical? The advice I received... It, 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 yes, that's the question you're asking, isn't it? It's, it's not about the letter, it's about the advice I received. No, it's about the letter you wrote. Well, I think I've covered that point. Yeah, well, it um, and I think I, I, I kind of made it very clear yesterday that I accepted all the re uh, recommendations and there was nothing in that... Um, in the process that occurred since the signing that suggested either in the immediate or in the uh, uh, the period fairly soon afterwards, that it was um, ambiguous, and I think it only became ambiguous because the work that I had um, authorised was not carried through. I'm obviously very sorry that uh, the fate of um, those uh, the two families that uh, were were deserted and the, and the loan woman, so uh, uh, was, um, the link was forgotten by the department. Can you explain why your response to the coroner did not articulate in clear terms that the, the work the coroner had recommended be done was not considered by you to be safety critical? Because of the advice that uh, I received and because of all the fail-safe that would indicate that I'd made a, a bad decision uh, was entirely absent from the scene. If you make a decision like this, which was a high-profile one, um, the very nature of things is that people pour over it and look at it very carefully. I've done a search of contemporary reports and newspapers, and I could see no indication of it. Um, the Labour Party didn't raise an objection, and, and I'm not saying this in a a part of political thing, but the, the job of the opposition is, is to challenge the government. They want to... Uh, our system works on, on kind of conflict and, and justification. You know, there was no urgent question, there was no request for um, uh, a debate, there was uh, no uh, adjournment debate, there, there was nothing that would indicate there was, that anything was wrong. There was actually quite a limited number of, of written parliamentary questions. Now, if... Uh, uh, someone was saying, well, uh, excuse me, just hold on a second, Pickles. Um, have you accepted these three points? And I said, of course I've accepted these, these, these three points. Then 
I would have done something to correct it. Now, how would I have corrected it? I probably would have been forced to make a statement to the House. Uh, uh, or I might have had to make a written ministerial uh, statement. But I was not aware that there was a problem. There was no indication within uh, the system that there was um, a problem. Had there been an indication, I would have taken action. I mean, after all, I did have a reputation of a Secretary of State prepared to take difficult decisions, uh, willing to put um, local authorities, uh, put commissioners in and remove their democratic control. You know, I took on um, the problems of, uh, of paedophilia in, in Rotherham, where others weren't prepared to do. I took control of Tower Hamlets, where others weren't prepared to do. And was used to people coming through my door or sending me a, a message to say things are not entirely happy. Um, and, and will you do something again? And I don't think on any <coughs> occasion did I ever say, go away, this is too difficult, or I'll leave it for the next person to deal with. Uh, um, you know, you can tell occasionally I, uh, I get a bit uh, hung up on duty. But being a Secretary of State is immensely important. You're there on a summer's lease. You're there for the service of the... Um, of the Prime Minister, will of the Prime Minister. So you've got to live every day as though it's, it's your last on, on duty and you want to make sure you're moving things forward. Uh, it's not meant to as a rhetorical question, but why wouldn't I? Why would I ignore it? What would be the point of ignoring it? It wouldn't make any sense. I'd accepted the, uh, the, uh, the, the recommendation. I put trust in the, uh, a bunch of officers who are regarded to be fine to do it. And I, and I expected it to be done. I, and I also, and I think this is an important caveat, I expected them to come and tell me that things weren't going right, uh, that either we needed more resources or we needed more clarification, as they did in countless other occasions. I mean, the job of a secretary, is, uh, is to say, is, is to deal with, I think, um, as Harold... Um, Macmillan described as a Venstair boy. There's nothing certain, you know, when, when you get up in the morning and wander into the office, it's not like a nine to five job, there's always something. Whose job was it to make sure that the letter which left your desk on the 20th of May 2013 with your signature was, at that moment in time, free from ambiguity as to whether the recommendations were in accepted in full as safety critical. Well, obviously, there were a number of officials that um, put in submissions and the from recollection, the letter did not change substantially from the draft letter that came with the submission, <coughs> saving for, a, 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 I think, a, for a small typo. Um, so obviously those officials had some responsibility. Um, those that advised me that it was, that we covered everything, bear responsibility. But it's my firm belief that they acted in good faith. I do not believe there was any deception uh, in order to try and manipulate it. I don't think for one moment that officials were saying, well, you know, I went to the inquiry and uh, uh, they just made, uh, the, you know, the coroner's inquiry, they made such a mess and they've suggested it's an ambiguous, and I don't think it is an ambiguous, and I don't think we should do it. Um, well, let's just palm the Secretary of State off. I don't, I don't believe any of that. Um, I firmly believe that they all acted in good faith. Uh, I think we've seen a degree of human error. I expressed before uh, the luncheon break my real worry now I have full knowledge about the well-being of that department because they do appear to have been in a, a bubble of their own, unconnected to the, uh, the, the political will or any kind of will within the department. It, it, you know, you've got a, 
when you're um, you're there, you've got a responsibility of 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 well being and uh, of looking after staff. And uh, what I've what I've heard, I find deeply worrying. Sorry, my, my question. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Who, whose job? This is this is a this is a whose job question. Oh, so this is about identifying people. So, Lord Pickers, I wonder if you can you can just help me. Wh whose okay. job was it <coughs> to make sure that the letter which left your desk on the 20th of May was free from the ambiguity admitted here by the department in this document? I'm sorry. I thought I'd answer that, and perhaps I should have made it clear. Its responsibility goes up the chain. People that uh, put in the first draft, they have a responsibility. People that agree the, the draft, they have a responsibility. Uh, uh, the people that put it into my box, they have a responsibility. Um, the, uh, the permanent secretary has a responsibility because they advise me. I have a responsibility uh, to make sure that that uh, letter is unambiguous. And it never crossed my mind for all the reasons that I said that it was, um, that, it, that it could have been constructed as ambiguous. I thought it was extraordinarily clear. I thought they'd done a good job. And I thought that we would deliver for the coronary, or more particularly, I thought we would deliver it, um, you know, to the families of, um, uh, of those that had, uh, that had died, which in my mind, without getting terribly sentimental, was... <coughs> more important than the coronary. You know, people died, the, the dead deserve the dignity of, of, of remembrance. The, 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 the dead deserve the dignity uh, of, uh, uh, for us to deal with, uh, which caused their untimely death. As Secretary of State, do you accept that it was your ultimate responsibility to ensure that your department followed through with the response to the coroner in a timely manner, giving them the recommendations, the ministerial and departmental priority that they deserved? Of course, it's got to be my responsibility, even if I wasn't aware. Even if, uh, you know, even if uh, people were continuously telling me, I'm the Secretary of State, so ultimately it's, it, it's my responsibility. Um, but I have to say, as a matter of fact, there was no indication from anyone that there was a problem. And I think that that is critical. And I don't think that <coughs> is about apportioning blames. It's certainly, I think, and it's beyond learning lessons, there is something that needs to be done within that department to ensure that where officials are overworked, harassed, and with respect, I think, I think it's the neutral world, confused, that it was addressed. Now, even under those circumstances, I can think of problems that, we've had, that we had uh, um, with, with, with some, uh, some of our press assistants. I can remember uh, problems that, that we have with a particular planner. Things I were aware of and, and things were done to help them. Had I known that the, that the uh, uh, building regulation team were living in a almost an isolation bubble, I would have addressed it and I, and I would have hoped that Mr Millet, I would have addressed it in a kind way rather than as a scolding way. I would have wanted to uh, be alongside them or I would have wanted people to be alongside them because that's the way you get the best out of people. But reading the limited e evidence, and you've been extraordinarily kind in reading out those things, those people don't sound very happy. They don't sound like they got up in the morning and came into work and thought, well, this is a great place to work. They, they sounded harassed. They, um, they saw problems all around. I think the most dispiriting thing uh, in the two days that uh, I've been with you uh, was a statement, and I can't remember which official said it, which was, I didn't think it was worth a fight. That is really bad. And do you accept those things happened on your watch and you are and were accountable for them as the Minister of State at the time? Or well, Secretary of State at the time. Secretary of State at the yeah. time. Yes. Of course. I mean, I've said that with <coughs> respect to you 
now to my certain knowledge four times uh, and I would repeat it of course you are at the top um, but it's not unreasonable to say it wasn't like I was you know ignoring this or willfully say oh it doesn't matter it wasn't I felt this was important but I felt I'd laid a, a train in order for it to be uh, to be to be dealt with and at the risk of repeating all the normal, the usual uh, whistles that would have gone off if there was something wrong were entirely silent. It's a big department. When I was given uh, advice, I never run away from a problem. I always addressed it. Can we then turn to a slightly different topic, which, okay. is, <clears throat> which is tracking the coroner's recommendations? Now, did you know as a fact that the department had no protocol or system in place for how to track and record a coroner's recommendation uh, in order to ensure that the work was carried out to deliver on any commitments made by the department in response? I'm astounded that that would be the case. Right. I, would have, I would have naturally have assumed that uh, they were... Uh, systems in place to ensure that decisions are followed through. That would be the normal business practice in any government department. Indeed, it would be the normal business practice, I would think, within law firms. Clearly, at a ministerial and top civil service, there was a, um, a tracking system for big decisions but that was really designed for um, for legislation yeah, and for yeah. fixed events. And when the process started of the revision of the um, of uh, approved document B, that particular tracking system would have been okay for part of it, but it wouldn't have been in any way adequate uh, to. Uh, to deal with the, with the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts. It'd be okay at a strategic. We'd kind of know when the consultation was going out. We'd know when first draft would have been available. We'd know when we were supposed to do the right round. We'd know all those kind of things. But they wouldn't deal with the, the normal day-to-day -day, um, uh, uh, events. Um, I never saw any evidence that my, uh, my um, department could not follow through on simple instructions or various events that w uh, would happen. I'm not sure they would need a specific, um, I suppose, your to-do list would be one of them. I'm not sure that they would have something that said coroner, but the ordinary <coughs> state of running a sensible department, I listened a little bit to the evidence that uh, uh, Miss Dawes uh, gave and the system that she set up when she became uh, the permanent secretary. Uh, which struck me as being um, enormously sensible, but even that quite of elaborate system didn't pick up the failure. Did you ever take steps to satisfy yourself that the Lacknell coroner's recommendations and the department's response to them uh, were on a tracker of some kind? They would have been on the tracker, the Wednesday tracker, as soon as uh, the process of revising uh, approved document B begun for sure, but the, the the department was responsible for the individual portions of the tracker. I mean, the tracker wasn't exactly an unusual device. It's it's a kind of common practice that you would see uh, in most businesses. Um, it's the official's job to run the process efficiently. I think if politicians started to meddle in, in that process, I'm not entirely sure that that would, uh, would work. Can I, can I uh, just, just a very small point, a very small point. I hadn't, the department seemed a very efficient department. Things generally arrived on time and in, in pretty good order. Had I seen any evidence that things were a bit slipshod and you know you'd ask for something and maybe three or four weeks later it turned up in a in an envelope and it wasn't proper but then 
at that point you would say, well, let, let me let me just go in and see what's happening. But I, <coughs> I, I would repeat, and it's a very fair question. Did I see any indication that the way in which the department was being run generally was that there was a, a problem of efficiency and the problem of following through? Well, no, I didn't see any evidence, but I would repeat, it was a very big department. You referred a moment ago to the Wednesday tracker and the, the amendments to approve document B in response to the lack of coroner's recommendations would have been on it. I just want to be crystal clear with you what, that, what you're referring to. What was the Wednesday tracker? Was it a document? It was a spreadsheet, I think. Uh, I mean, it's been a frustration to me that we haven't been able to find it, but I think that was a problem of search. But I believe uh, Brandon Lewis managed to find um, a version uh, of, of, of the tracker, and if you have one, I'll happily take you through. But you need to bear in mind, it's for big issues. It's to deal with things that will span over several weeks to, to do. So it would be on, but say, for example, the coroner's letter, it, it wouldn't be on that, because, of course, the coroner's rec um, letter is in itself a tracker, because once it arrives, the time starts to tick. And uh, as you will have noticed, uh, on all the subs, there's a constant reminder on the subs that, that things have to be in by such and such a date. And, and trackers aren't really much use on anything relatively small, but they would, be, they would have been quite useful uh, with regard to um, uh, the amendment of approved document uh, B. In fact, they were, they were designed, it was designed for something like that. It could handle a big bill, it could handle something as small as uh, a statutory instrument. And um, approved document B would, I think, fit pretty neatly in between those two extremes. Did you ever see any of your responses to the coroner's recommendations on this spreadsheet you're referring to? Um, no, because it wouldn't have been appropriate uh, to put them on the spreadsheet right. because the time was so short. Where it would have been quite useful would have been the amendment to approve document B which would have lended itself, and the reason it would have lended itself is there would have been some, dis, uh, some dis, uh, distinct periods where things had to be done. And perhaps it might be helpful to say the main purpose of the tracker, which you read from the right to the left, is to ensure there's a continuous throw from the left to the final date. It, it would have been no use for the, the Secretary of State say, uh, arriving in office, I don't know, in May, and saying, OK, well, let's just see, so let's see the document. Because, you know, these things need to be gone. If, and if deadlines are mixed, then the right starts to move forward, and you don't want the right to move forward. The whole purpose of the tracker is to ensure, I mean, as you might... Uh, you might say in the text, I'll say, you don't, you, you don't, want, to, you don't want, want to run out of WEF. And in any way, that weaving analogy is right. Because if the WEF is broken, the whole line is broken, and the whole purpose of the tracker would, would disappear. Um, <clears throat> well, the weaving analogy may be very helpful if we had a document. But my question really is, do you ever remember seeing a document, which you've described uh, variously as the Wednesday tracker or the tracker, which had any of the milestones for delivery of your promises to the L Lachnall coroner uh, on them. The principle, remember this is designed for big projects, so the tracker would be used for part of the big project. Um, things like drafting, you know, uh, uh, things like uh, consultation periods and the like. And I think the next big milestone the big piece of unfinished business uh, would have been the uh, revision of approved documents uh, uh, a B. And I mean, given that the research arrived, I think, in February um, 15, I would have thought that in itself would have triggered the whole process. But I understand that that, that tracker system was ended. And 
was replaced with a system that uh, uh, that Melanie put in place. And I don't think we should be tied up to a, a, a particular way of doing it. It's the result that's happened. There's nothing magical about the tracker. It's about creating progress and getting things done. <coughs> yeah. um, in the same way, the coroner's letter is a very sensible thing because it actually makes you make a response within a particular period. Yeah. Um, Lord Pickles, f forgive me, but it, I, it's really a yes or no answer. Um, is that, Did you ever see a document or didn't you? And the reason I just want to find out is because we don't want to have missed something given that we haven't been able to identify or find such a document. So, um, forgive I think me, it's there. I, I, let me ask the question again, because I think we may have got a bit distracted with, with weaving. But uh, did, did you ever... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> did you ever see a tracker with any of the time scales or milestones for delivery <coughs> of your promises to the Lackal coroner on it during your time as Secretary of State? <laughs> I don't think the tracker that we use would have been useful for that because it's, <coughs> it's putting projects together. I mean, the short answer and the strictly accurate answer is yes, I did see a Lacknell uh, uh, coroner's report on, but it was placed on the basis of a forthcoming event. We thought that the uh, coroner's inquiry would be reporting just slightly earlier. When it wasn't, it came straight off. And there was no point in putting it back on because we very quickly got the letter. There was no point in putting the tracker on the, um, uh, no point in putting the letter on the tracker because the letter would have been quicker than the tracker. Because, it, you know, given you've got a limited time span, if it arrived, I don't know, on a Wednesday, I can't remember the day, you would have actually lost an entire week if you were going to use a tracker to do anything. The letter itself drives progress forward. Now, can we, I think we still have them on the screen, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in front of you, uh, Lord Pickles. Can we please go uh, back in this document to page two, paragraph seven? Uh, and I'll read that with you. Reflecting on its role in the issues to be examined in this module, the department continues to learn the lessons of the past and has conscientiously explored where its actions contributed to an overarching building safety system that has subsequently been shown to be unfit for purpose with catastrophic uh, consequences. Our work over the past few years has found that the department did not have a good understanding of how the regulatory system was working in practice, nor of how well it was being enforced. There was insufficient oversight of the system by the government, and the right assurances were not sought. Uh, now, um, I think the next uh, sentence is actually quite important uh, as well. Uh, very well. Had the building regulations, building standards, and statutory guidance been followed and enforced with reasonable diligence, a large-scale cladding fire could not have happened. <clears throat> the department should have done more to take on board the learning and recommendations triggered by other fires, including the tragic events at Lacknell House, including exploring whether the system was working as intended. Similarly, correspondence from the all-party parliamentary group on fire safety should have been addressed in a timelier manner, with more done to probe the issues raised by them. Now, yeah. what I wanted to focus on uh, was, if we go back a page, please, okay, page sorry. two, um, uh, the sentence uh, six lines down from the start, which says there was insufficient. And uh, do you see that? Insufficient oversight of the system by government and the right assurances were not sought. And also the previous sentence I've read to you. Mm. Do, do you agree uh, with uh, the sentence that I've just read to you? I'm not sure. I think I'd need to have greater understanding of what that was meant. Did it mean that the liaison between uh, the um, department dealing with uh, building regulations and those supervising the implementation of the building regulations, uh, did I, was the contact between those two groups of people sufficient? Um, uh, that's what I think uh, it means, because of course we're not an op operational department, but we, we do organise and we do fund regular peer group uh, discussions. I mean, you saw the, the, the list that we had in terms of consultation when we were looking at housing standards. That kind of thing would be appropriate. So I suppose they are saying, 
you know, were messages coming up from the industry and were those messages being ignored? Now, you know, if some, I don't know whether you want to talk about the old party group, um, but laying aside the question of, um, of sprinklers, they were clearly making a number of important um, uh, expressions of worry that struck me as being entirely legitimate. Um, w w were the, was the department ignoring the, the, um, the message because they didn't like the messenger? And that's something that obviously I've thought quite a bit about since I saw those rejection letters uh, when I went through the papers. And I, th and, and I think, but I don't think, unless I've entirely misunderstood the intentions of the current Secretary of State, I don't think it's his intention to try and make the department an operational department. It has to be about, I think, the relationship between the sector and knowing it is. I may be wrong, um, uh, but it would require a, a considerable change in the nature of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the department. And, and, and I can think of different ways in which you might be able to achieve that. Does that tell us that your understanding of your department during the time you were Secretary of State was that regulatory overview did not fall as one, as one of its responsibilities? No, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that. Oh. I am saying exactly that. But what I am saying is, is that, that in order to have regulatory overview, you need to be in touch with the sector. You need to kind of understand that what, what people, what is, I mean, I know, I mean, this is not meant to slip, but folks who are putting on Wellington boots and going on site, um, you know, kind of uh, looking at electrical fitting, uh, making sure things are, are, are happening in, in accordance with the building regulations, you need to get some kind of feedback for what the reality is there. And that's why you, you, uh, we saw this morning that very long list of um, what sometimes is, is misleadingly called stakeholders. <coughs> you need to be in contact with the stakeholding uh, a, a community. And I think I have expressed concerns, real concerns, about this strange bubble that the building, um, you know, the building regulation people seem to be in. Uh, I, I, so I can kind of understand, I think I've got a, a, a fair way that they, that they were sort of kind of out of the loop inside the department and not communicating really with the department. I'm not entirely sure whether that, whether that lack of, um, of communication might have also gone the other way. Now, let me, let me try and get this through a slightly different route. Okay. Um, now, Melanie Dawes told us, and that's, perhaps I'll show you the transcript rather than summarising it. Day 249, page 26, please. 249 page 26. Uh, and if you go to <coughs> line uh, 22, and, and I'll, to be fair to you, show you, the, show you the question. Okay. The question is at line 16. Going back to what you said a moment ago, why do you think building regulations was not a priority area at that time? Who had decided that? <coughs> Answer. I mean, it's a question to which I've given a lot of thought over the last five years, and I'm still not quite sure I know the answer. I mean, my overall impression here, and I'm just, I'm sure we'll come on to this, is that the department just didn't see that it had a role of oversight of that system. It saw that its role was one of writing the rules, and it understood that there was a role for local government to do by way of approvals and enforcement. But everything else in the middle, as you do when you're performing regulatory oversight, and that I do today through Ofcom, wasn't, I believe, understood by the department as something that needed to be done or as something that needed to be done by the department. Now, just th that's what she told the inquiry, as I've shown you. Would you agree with that approach or that view? I think that's just answered the second part of the question I was asking. Was this kind of bubble that they were existing, were they uh, effectively deciding that the the top didn't want to listen to them, the department didn't want to listen to them, 
was, I think, what Melanie is saying is that they weren't talking to the sector. I'm not sure that's what it means, but the normal construction of the words might suggest that. And if that is the case, that would be worrying. Um, because how else are we going to know uh, what's happening? You, you kind of rely uh, on, on that kind of information. I mean, if you, it's a long time ago, and half of it was under a slightly different system. But if I think back to my council uh, leaders' day, you'd, you'd kind of want to know what was going on in the, the footings that was, were going on in, in Swates Brow or the development that was taking place uh, uh, in Park Lane. You'd want to know those kind of things. If there were some kind of, um, of problems, we'd uh, been through the uh, problems in New, Newbury uh, Square of, of things like uh, 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 those bison constructions, which is a, oh, a kind of a weird kind of prefabrication that just went so dreadfully wrong and got caught up in the Poulsen uh, scandal. See, you'd want to know what was going on. I wasn't expected, I wouldn't have normally expected people at that level to be regularly <coughs> going out on site visits, so I wouldn't have objected in order to kind of understand mystery shopping that we're doing that, but uh, I, I, I have, I've no idea um, uh, what the situation is, but I, I hope that the current uh, permanent secretary, well, I'm sure they will be, will be looking very hard at ensuring that the information flows through the building regulations both ways. Because if it doesn't, not only are the building regulations the losers of that, but the department is the loser of that, because it doesn't inform good decisions. Well, Brian Martin told the inquiry, and just for our references, day 253, page 162, lines 4 to 10, that it wasn't the department's job to police the system. That's what he said. Yeah, but that's not... Do you agree? Yeah, no, 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 no. He's probably right. They aren't policemen. They aren't enforcers. Of course not. But I would have expected, and I would have reasonably expected them, to be interested observers of what's happening on the scene. And, and again, I don't want to cause anybody, anybody any trouble, but that just further adds to my view that what we're talking about is a bubble that is almost beginning to invent its own rules. Uh, let's go back to the department's opening written submissions to this module, please. Uh, okay. And now let's go to page three. We've just gone into it. Okay. Uh, and uh, on page three, uh, which which uh, paragraph? I, I, it's my fault. I need to pick this up with you at the bottom of page two. We'd actually read it together, but let's okay. go back to the bottom of page two. It says in the penultimate line there, the department should have done more to take on board the learning and recommendations triggered by other fires, yeah. including the tragic events at Lacknell House, yeah. including exploring whether the system was working as intended. Similarly, correspondence from the all-party parliamentary group on fire safety should have been addressed in a timelier manner, with more done to probe the issues raised by them. Yeah. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, I do. You do? Oh, definitely. And do you accept um, that the failure to do more as set out there was a failing on your part as Secretary of State? Uh, on the basis that I'm responsible for everything. Um, the fact that I didn't know about it, that uh, no one briefed me, and that those letters came as a real shock, um, is no reasonable excuse because ultimately it is always uh, my fault. I mean, um, I mean to me, uh, I mean, David uh, was a very clever, very good politician, and uh, I say that not for the you know, kind of affection of someone that knew him through Parliament. Uh, uh, he was the same age as me. We were in the Young Conservatives together. I knew him going back nearly 50 years, and he really knew how the system worked. And uh, I've been kind of heartened when I've seen some of the more dogged letters that he was sending, that, it, that, he, was really doing the, uh, that he was really doing the business. And and uh, making the department uh, come to special terms. What I didn't like, and you said I made a rather 
I suppose, tweedy little reference of not being up to the usual standards. But what I find slightly offensive is that we had a... that the minister allowed themselves to become the the mouthpiece of what was clearly a grudge between um, the department or the building section and the um, and the old party group, and in particular, uh, I think the, the, the permanent secretary who was something with the Sprinkler Association, I think I can't entirely bring his name to mind. And that doesn't seem to be uh, entirely sensible. You shouldn't reject the <coughs> message because of the messenger. Yes, thank you very much, Lord Pickles. Uh, I'm just looking and seeing what's on the rest of my screen, but I think those are all the questions I have for you. I'm extremely grateful to you. <coughs> I'm going to ask the Chairman for the usual break. Um, Mr Chairman, perhaps now might be the con a convenient moment for yes. that break. Well, Pickles, when uh, Council gets to the end of his questions, as you probably know, we have a break to give him a chance <coughs> to check that he's not omitted anything and also to give others who are not here but are following the proceedings a chance to suggest further questions. So we'll, yeah. we'll take that break now. Um, Mr. Blit, how long do you think you might need for this purpose? Uh, I, I, shall we, can I ask for 15 minutes? And if we need more, um, then I'll you ask. Could, well, what I'm going to say then is, because uh, it's just easier to do it this way, is 10 past three. Okay. Uh, just over 15 yeah. minutes. Um, if more time is required, you can let the usher... Yeah. Yes, ask you. the usher to come and tell us. I, I would just emphasise again, I'm here for as long as you want me. Well, that's very good. Thank you very much. Um, well, we'll see if you, we'll, we'll come back at ten past three. At that point, we'll see if there are any more questions. Yeah, OK. And, uh, perhaps if you go to the usher. And I will. Thank you very much. See. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Millet. Ten past three, and thank if you, you need more time, just let us Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.
Would you ask Lord Pickle to come back in, please? Right, Lord Pickles. Well, let's see if there are any more questions for you. All right. Yes, Mr Millett? Yes, Mr Chairman. Just one or two. OK. Um, Lord Pickles, uh, if the deregulatory policies promulgated by the government in which you served were not intended to affect life safety uh, and regulations to do with life safety, particularly fire safety, then whose responsibility within government was it to explain and clarify that to junior ministers, civil servants, uh, and SPADs? Uh, well, the SPADs, were, uh, the SPADs and the junior ministers would have been involved with the decision. The thing <coughs> that has uh, concerned me as the two years progressed is how effective was the civil service at making sure that that message was being heard. And again, I think the jury's out on that. I may say something about this in my closing remarks, but increasingly I'm beginning to see this bubble and I'm beginning to think in terms of the housing regulations almost becoming, they've got themselves into a world that's almost becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy, a kind of a parody of of um, of what we wanted, um, but in terms of disseminating the message, it's my responsibility to disseminate the message among the politicians. It's the civil service, the permanent secretary, and the um, director generals to ensure that that message is discerned among the um, among the civil service. I'm responsible for policy. Um, uh, civil services responsibility for the implementation of that policy. Of course, the, the, the roles merge. You would, each of us would kind of take on some of the function of the other. And that's the nature of the job. And also, if you're in harness with somebody for five years, it's almost like a peculiar marriage. You can't, you start to be able to finish each other's sentences. So, uh, you know, to, to a degree. I'd always considered it to be an extraordinarily well-run um, uh, a, a department. I never felt that civil servants has, uh, uh, had let me down. But I have to say, my worries are considerable about the, the well-being of the, of, of, of the building regulation department. And finally, <coughs> Lord Pickles. Um, uh, I need to ask you a question which we reserve for particular witnesses in this inquiry. Uh, looking back on uh, your time as Secretary of State for the DCLG uh, and looking back over the evidence that you and I have travelled through over the last almost two days now, is there anything you would have done differently? And we travelled through it, I thought, in a very courteous, uh, courteous way. Actually, Mr Millett, my answer, what I obviously prepared because I'd, I kind of watched you doing this and I realised I was going to be asked, is entirely different from the one uh, that I'm about to give. What I was going to say is, maybe I should have put in the letter the simple sentence and I accept the coroner's recommendations. Would that have changed things? And your diligence and your choice of, uh, of examples have made me come to the view, I don't think it would have made any difference whatsoever. I think there was a, a kind of mindset that existed in parts of the, of the department that just simply ignored what was happening, made a, a, a view about what we were, and came to it. But we should never lose the sight. This is not about deregulation, one in, one out, number of regulations, fancy letters from the Prime Minister, this, that, and the other. It's the fact that, uh, that Michel Udoka 
It should be 13 now. And here we are. We're still discussing it. It's still not there. And the conditions existed that there were people putting things in uh, uh, into panels and the like that were combustible. The idea to me is how would anybody ever want to do that? How would they ever think it was a good idea? Um, as I said, we will see various court cases that will uh, that will put it together, but ultimately it comes uh, it it comes down to to Michelle and to the nameless. I think it was ninety six people who who were, who were killed in in, in in the Grenville fire. It's it's them we should think about when we're arguing the toss. Ultimately, it's as I said I think earlier that you know the dead. Um, deserve the dignity of being remembered by name, the dead deserve the dignity of a solution. And I'm sure you will come to that. Um, but in conclusion, Mr. Miller, can I thank you um, for the professional uh, and courteous way in which you've uh, uh, sought to get my evidence. And can I thank the panel uh, for the courtesy of hearing me and for the staff for the enormously um, helpful way in which I've been, they allow me to conduct uh, my evidence. Yes, thank you very much, Lord Pickles. Thank you. Well, Lord Pickles is right that I should thank you <coughs> on behalf of all the members of the panel. It is very helpful to us to hear uh, f from someone in your position, which is perhaps not very usual, and we've learned a lot as a result. And I'm sorry that it's interfered with your arrangements for today, but there were things we needed to ask you and the help you needed to give us. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, but that is the end of your evidence, and of course you're now free to go. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. It was, it was an honour to give evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Millett. Now that's... Uh, all we have for today, is it? <coughs> uh, not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Um, Mr Chairman, before we close the evidence for this last part of Module 6 formally, which I will do in a, a moment, yes. uh, I should just read into the record a number of references to further witness statements which should be taken as in the record. Yes, uh, and a list of those references and the relevant or the correlate statements uh, are to be found under one umbrella reference, and that is IDX0923. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, uh, those statements can be taken as to be read into the record, and they will be publicly available uh, on the inquiry's website as soon as they can be uploaded. But uh, yes, Mr Chairman, subject to that, that formally closes uh, the evidence for this part of Module 6, subject only to closing submissions to be received in due course. Thank you very much. And uh, the inquiry will sit again on Monday of next week to start the next module. Module 4. Yes. Well, thank you all very much. We shall uh, break at that point and resume on Monday at 10 o'clock when we shall hear opening statements in Module 4. Thank you very much.